Investors Chronicle. Hello and welcome back to the IC Interviews. I'm Dave Baxter and today I have a very topical guest for the podcast. That's Noelle Cazales. She's a bond fund manager. She works on the well-known, widely followed Rathbone Ethical Bond Fund, but also on the Rathbone Strategic Bond Fund and the High Quality Bond Fund. Before we get going, it is worth noting that Noelle and I are speaking on the 29th of September, just a few days before we publish this podcast. Normally that difference wouldn't really have much bearing on things, but given the huge developments we've seen in bond markets in just the last few working days since the government's mini budget, it is worth bearing in mind that events may well overtake us. So, Noel, thank you very much for, for joining me. As you, you mentioned just before we came on, bonds perhaps unfortunately are no longer written off as a, a boring asset class as they have been for many years. You know, to recap briefly, it's been a, a pretty busy week for bond investors. On the back of the mini budget, we've seen some big spikes in the yields on government bonds in the UK. I believe we saw a 20 year high on some of the kind of longer maturity bonds. And say we look at some of the kind of benchmarks, we've, uh, if you look at the 10 year gilt, the yield has moved beyond 4%, which is, you know, very high compared with recent history. Some of the selling in parts of the bond market has caused havoc for pension funds, caused various issues there. And we then saw the extraordinary development of the Bank of England kind of stepping in as almost a buyer of last resort on certain bonds in order to try and just steady the ship again in these uncertain times. I think it's probably best to start with a focus on that, really. I mean, this is this is quite unusual action from, from Bank of England. What's your take on it? What does it mean now for kind of UK government bonds and and how should it affect kind of positioning for, for bond investors? Yeah, sure. I mean, as you said, it is very unusual times mm. and you've highlighted, you know, very well the, the moves that we've kind of seen after the announcement of the mini budget. But perhaps to give a little bit more context, we've seen, you know, the two year guild yield rich yields of, you know, above four and a half percent. And that's very close to yields that we see in emerging markets in the likes of the Philippines or Indonesia. Mm. We've also seen some long dated assets. I mean, the long end of the curve, as you said, was under a lot of pressure and pension fund had to start, you know, selling and, and widening some of their positions. But to kind of put some context, I guess, some of the long dated guilds or linkers, if you take the 2073 linker, its value halved in only three sessions. So I guess what the Bank of England did is really act to maintain the financial stability of the UK and as a result help the viability of many pension funds that were you know being questions so i guess in that sense you know i think it was uh, very much needed and since then we've seen a kind of sense of stability returning to the market i mean it was pretty incredible moves the day of the announcement if you were buying in the morning it was on wednesday 28th if you were buying in the morning the 40 year guilds and selling it at the close, you would have made more than a 40% returns. And so you can see the kind of moves that we have in, in bond market in what traditionally would have been described as a kind of boring, steady, you know, as a class. But yeah, in terms of where we are now, I mean, it's a pretty tr tricky situation really for the Bank of England. So they've announced up to 65 billion of buying of very long dated gilts between now and the 13th of October. So it's very much a temporary measure to restore that kind of stability. In one hand, they are now buying bonds, i.e. an accommodative policy, mm. while on the other hand, they continue to tighten the monetary policy and continue to rise or increase interest rates. So it can only be temporary because you can see some conflict. And I think, you know, over the next few months, the, the kind of key mission of the Bank of England is going to continue on fighting the inflationary pressures um, that we are seeing. The Bank of England action was necessary to stabilize markets, but it doesn't really change the huge amount of uncertainty investors are currently facing. I think for that to change, more clarity is needed very much from the government in terms of their borrowing plan, because that tends to affect the yield curve. Um, and also more is needed on their plans uh, as to whether spending is, or the tax cuts are going to be directed because it has an impact on inflation and we've seen you know the short end of the curve which is very sensitive to interest rate movement moving up and down every single day mm -hmm. so we need more clarity um on that as well and better communication from, 
communication from the government. And I think there was a meeting yesterday uh, between the chancellor and senior bankers, and that's very much the plea was more communication, and if possible, ahead of the 23rd of November, which is the date that has been communicated. Mm. It's, it's interesting, I suppose, how much of monetary policy in recent years has been kind of expectations management, and that's um, that's become even even more difficult. And perhaps you need to back it up with action. But I mean, with with the kind of caveat that, as you said, things are very much in flux. Kind of what you know, the bond market's always a very good kind of indicator of various elements of sentiment. In terms of things like kind of rate rises, what is what currently appears to be priced in? Yes, yeah, so since the, the mini budget, we've seen once again a big rise in interest rate expectation. So the market is now pricing in 150 basis points of hike by November. Mm. So November is the next Bank of England meeting. So it could be, I guess, you know, 150 basis points in one go, or we could see an intra meeting hike and then another hike at the meeting. The Bank of England for now is pushing, you know, any kind of Hints that they would look at the, the decision intra meeting. So, yeah, 150 basis points of hike by November. And then when I look at longer, you know, uh, interest rate expectation, it would be base rate peaking just short of 6% next May. So, mm. still, you know, from where we are now, is, which is base rate of 2.25%, still quite a significant um, tightening of monetary policies priced into markets. And it's been quite a, you know, quite a strong correction, I guess. Um, where do we go from there? It's very difficult to assess. It's a lot of different data points, a lot of different moving parts, be it, you know, the economy and how the economy is um, coping, being what happened to the mortgage market or being what happened to the government policy. So, yeah, I would expect from here to continue to see a huge amount of volatility in this interest rate expectations. And I think, you know, it's really th that volatility that has prompted many banks to just pull out of the mortgage market and mm. just reassess where we are and how they can price their mortgages. So some, I suppose some investors will be asking now kind of, is there, after this big sell-off, is there value on the likes of UK government bonds? From what you say, it sounds like you your answer would perhaps be like, not sure yet, or? I think it depends. If you can weather some volatility, mm. some part of the curve, you know, offer good value but it's very difficult to say with confidence today that you know we've seen the worst of it so many moving parts i suppose one one interesting theory you mentioned the kind of um five six percent sort of base um base rate scenario there, there is kind of one argument that perhaps that's priced in but equally a central banker may kind of resist that because of concerns about recession and and perhaps people would make make the argument for that as a buying opportunity but then you you do move back to the kind of scenario of, I suppose, tolerating um, higher inflation. And, and one kind of point I want to put to you or question, I suppose, is more, you know, inflation is regarded as an enemy of bonds. Rising rates are regarded as an enemy of bonds. I mean, is there is there kind of a lesser evil there or is, is there a slightly less horrible scenario in which to be in as a bond investor? Well, I guess, you know, when you look at inflation or rising rates, um, there are some ways as bond investors that you can protect yourself mm -hmm. from that sensitivity. One of which is to buy a floating rate bonds. So effectively your coupon would change, you know, every three months, six months, depending on the prospectus based on interest rates. It would reset as interest rates go higher. You can also decide to position, you know, in the shorter end of the curve, which is less sensitive to interest rate expectation. And that's what we've been doing in our funds or our three funds, you know, when you compare them to their peers, they tend to be underweight duration. Mm -hmm. So you do have ways to to protect yourself. But yes, for for sure, it's been a very, very tough environment for for bond investors. And when I look at the UK 10-year gilts, since the start of the year, it's done more than 20%. So it's effectively mm -hmm. in bear market territory now. Yes. Yeah. Again, I guess moving away from that kind of boring, sleepy stereotype for, for bond investors. But I think, sorry, perhaps some something else that um, I should mention is one way as well to look at it and look at the yields we have on offer now is that if you can buy a bond and hold it to maturity, effectively you lock in the yield. So for example, you can buy right now the two-year gilts. Uh, it's yielding four and a half percent and it will mature in two years. So unless the UK government defaults on that, you'd get your effectively four and a half percent in the next two years. 
that's not bad compared to what you get on cash at the moment. But of course, if inflation overshoots and gets to 18%, well, suddenly, you know, that 4.5% doesn't look that attractive but you can still lock in and you know if you buy and hold um some of the yields on offer are, are quite interesting i think if you don't mind the volatility yeah yeah and and you mentioned um sort of corporate bonds as well how i mean i, I suppose all eyes have been turned on the, the government bond space but have have we seen kind of corporate bond yields tracking what's been going on um you know amidst all the kind of the for selling and the, and the mayhem we've seen in the government bond space. What's kind of, what's the situation there at the minute? So, I guess you know it's normal that we look at government bonds because they will be a big part mm-hmm. of our return. But the second kind of driver that we look at is credit spreads, and um, really what we've seen this year is a double whammy. So we've seen yields on government debts rising very quickly and also credit spreads moving wider as we've seen you know tensions in ukraine we've seen the cost of living crisis etc etc but in terms of selling pressure and things that we've seen over the last let's say week um yes things have been moving wider but it's probably been Mm. a little bit more contained than i expected Mm. um we've seen before the bank of england announcement some for sellers so the problem is kind of flows if you start to have huge amount of redemptions that's when you have to be a for seller and you are selling at a pretty difficult time in the market um and it tends to kind of it tends to force prices down um we've seen a little bit of that uh, before the bank of england announcement but it seems to have again a, a little bit more stable be a little bit more stable now with a two-way kind of functioning markets so far yeah and and have you seen any kind of opportunities in in the corporate space? Um, I suppose there's a, a broad spectrum there, whether it's kind of your investment grade or perhaps your kind of riskier forms of debt. Yeah, I think you know when when we think about perhaps more longer term, we think they start to be value in investment grade, and that's why I would have said to you, you know, a, a couple of weeks ago as well. Um, mm-hmm. The market in terms of valuations in the investment grade has retraced quite a lot. So the implied default rates um, implied by valuation is around 8%. When you look at the market since the 70s, the average has been around 1%. So you get compensated, let's say, eight times an average scenario. But the worst has been since the 70s is 4 so 4%. So you get compensated for twice a kind of worst case scenario so we do think you know valuations look quite attractive Mm. and also when we look at the fundamentals of the companies that we invest in they are pretty good Uh, for example in q2 so we had a lot of q2 results in the last month or so leverage has been in check which is a very important metric for bond investors Um, and also we've seen interest cover at very comfortable levels so interest cover why is it important for us as credit investor because if they start to decline you start to effectively move move closer to the point of default. Right now, they're pretty comfortable level. And in fact, it's been because we've had low interest rate for so long, company have been increasing the maturity of their debt. So before we start to see any kind of default or refinancing risk, I think we're still kind of um, a long way from it. From it. So um, yeah, I guess, you know, even though I think there will be more volatility in the next few months and it's difficult to... Um, know when the peak in spread is going to be. I think for investor with long-term horizons and that can weather a bit of volatility, um, some valuation in investment grade credits are um, pretty interesting. If I look at the yields, you know, on our ethical bond fund, the yield to maturity is now above 7%, it's 7.2%. I mean, it's been a long time since we've seen this kind of yields on offer. That's really interesting. Um, yeah, I, I was going to ask, you mentioned kind of leverage, I was going to ask about the issue of I suppose, the extent to which companies are um, indebted. Um, I mean, would you expect yourselves to become more cautious about kind of lending to companies in specific sectors? Or, you know, yeah, do you feel quite relaxed? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we're definitely already cautious and have been cautious on some sectors for a while. Um, I guess, you know, in terms of the key metrics as a credit investor that I like to follow in investment grade would be uh, the leverage, but also liquidity, um, and perhaps actually even more in high yield, but liquidity, you know, and all of these metrics are kind of uh, okay. Um, but then when we look at vulnerabilities of some sectors, 
one that is quite, you know, uh, topical is the uh, the sectors with high energy spends or high energy mix in their cost base. Uh, they've suffered quite a lot. In IG, you know, what that means is that effectively their margins are going to compress. And in high yield, which is where we see actually a lot more risk of, you know, valuations retra retracing, but also uh, refinancing risk. Uh, it means that some companies are going to really struggle to refinance their debt in the markets. Um, so it's definitely something that uh, we, we keep an eye on. Um, and in terms of sector, I mean, we've been kind of worried about real estate. Um, you know, they tend to be quite correlated with interest rate costs. Uh, and also retail retailers, I mean, they have a lot of, uh, a lot, a, a huge part of that cost is in energy. And we've seen in the high yield market, some names really struggling in terms of their energy spend. Are there any areas, I suppose, on the flip side, whether it's in kind of high yield or um, I suppose things like triple Bs, the, you know, potential fallen angels, um, if things are wrong. Are there any areas where you think specifically concerns are overdone and perhaps there are kind of things are actually looking a bit more interesting? I think in financials. So one of the area that we really like is insurance. So insurance, most of their bonds are uh, investment grade rated and even the deep subordinated bonds. But this kind of businesses now, because of regulation, they are running huge surpluses in terms of capital. So their solvency ratio at Q2, actually, and they have half year results, were around, you know, 200%. So effectively, they hold twice more capital than the, what the regulator is asking them to do. And yet they trade as high beta securities. So we've seen actually, uh, a, you know, kind of valuations retracing quite a lot in this uh, the securities. So that's an area where we continue to find a lot of value. And also because of this regulation that has been, been changing, you know, on the insurance and banks since 2008, effectively a lot of their bonds are going to become obsolete and not count towards capital. So by the end of 2025, we expect a lot of the insurance bonds to be called or tender. And what that means is that they usually, you know, in terms of asking investor to tender a bond, they, use, they tend to pay premium. So it really gives us uh, an interesting um, area to invest where effectively you don't take too much duration risk. So you don't have a lot of interest rate sensitivity. Mm -hmm. You know, if they're called in three years time, that's not a lot. And you take more credit risk, but we feel because valuations are attractive in that space, that credit risk that we're getting compensated for. Mm. It it's interesting, I suppose, when you talk about credit risk, um, and and I guess kind of yeah, more generally, a kind of an issue that's on many people's minds is is the R words, the kind of prospect of a recession, uh, and I suppose that will you know the extent of that would vary from kind of region to region and market to market. Um, but how you know if we do have kind of a, a serious economic downturn, how does that affect your thinking as as a as a bond manager, you know, what areas then do you think are going to be more fragile and perhaps um, which areas are going to offer some some buffering? I guess a good way of looking at that is looking at what we've been doing in our strategic bond funds. So it's more kind of a go anywhere mm. um, remit. And what I would say is that we've been favoring investment grade over high yields. Um, so in investment grade, as I say, we feel the valuations are kind of, you know, overcompensating us in a way for the credit risk we're taking. It's a very different story right now in high yields, um, because if you look at high yield valuation haven't retraced to the same extent, but also we start to kind of um, see um, pockets of vulnerability. Um, so businesses tend to be more levered, they tend to be more cyclical, but also their debt maturities tend to be shorter than their uh, investment grade counterpart, counterparts. So we're going to start to hit uh, refinancing rates much quicker than uh, mm. than we see in um, in investment grade. So yeah, I think that's that's an area that um, we're kind of trying to stay clear of. Um, not so much in financials, as I was saying, in financials, we like this kind of high yield legacy part of, of the markets, but more in terms of corporates. Uh, we've already seen actually in retail, for example, as I was mentioning before, some companies really struggling to, to access the market.
on the on the financials kind of point, you know, that's always been a big area of focus, in particular for the for Rathbone ethical bonds. Um, I mean, are there any kind of challenges there that investors need to be aware of, or does this kind of? So I suppose that's been a rich source of returns in the last decade for those those bond investors who have wanted to delve there. Is is there anything that could kind of put that off course? Yeah, I mean, I think some of the more more cyclical smaller businesses within finance either are more exposed to a downturn are going to start to see some pressure if we move into you know pretty deep recession but the kind of businesses that we invested tend to be more you know well diversified big uk lender or or international lender so they do have quite a lot of a lever you know to to pull And as we've seen during the COVID crisis, you know, it becomes a problem for equity investors way before it becomes a problem for bond investors. And what I mean by that is, you know, in COVID, we've seen the regulator asking banks to stop their dividends. Um, And effectively, what I mean for bond investors, I mean, they kind of keep it in the capital bit, which means more protection for us. But also, I think financials, because of that regulations, are in a very different place than they were in 08. I mean, some banks in 08 had four or five percent capital ratios. Now we see some banks with 30 percent capital ratios. And depending on where you invest in the capital structure, you know, your level of protection is is pretty good. And um, just coming back to one thing we, we discussed earlier, um, I mentioned the kind of triple B um, rating of, of, I suppose, corporate debt so that's kind of the lowest rung of um, investment grade and some sometimes a concern you know people worry that can things can go wrong and they can fall down into the the high yield kind of category um you know prompting some some sell-off um how what's your kind of view on that kind of part of the market at the minute yeah i'm just trying to think i haven't really seen any kind of big warning from rating agencies in terms of sector Mm -hmm potential downgrades, things like that. Um, but yeah, it's something that we we always look at because as you say, that's when you tend to see a lot of false sellers. So uh, fund managers with investment grade mandates needed to just sell the bonds because the bond is moving into the high yield indices. Um, there hasn't been any names in our portfolio that we sold on that basis, but I would say some sectors that are at risk would be they're kind of real estate companies and the retailers as well. Um, two sectors that we're kind of avoiding at the moment, to be honest. And then, and then it's it's very name specific. Usually, when you see you know downgraded at that um, you know that point. So normally you'll uh, you'll read about it before it happens. Yeah, or at least you would. Yeah, you would pick it up that the business is um, mm. already struggling, really. But I mean, what we've been doing in the last year is reduce the names that we have in the portfolio that we felt were more at risk of a recession. Um, and that was, you know, way before the moves that we've seen in the last week or so. Um, so we feel we're in a pretty strong position to avoid this kind of, you know, downgrades from triple B minus to high yield. And there, were those names in, well, probably not in the sectors you mentioned? Was it more specific issues or? Uh, mainly on the sector I mentioned, yeah. Okay, very, very interesting. Um, I'm afraid that is all we have time for. Um, I'd like to again thank Noel for for coming on at a very uncertain and uh, topical time for, for the bond investor. And thank you very much for listening. Take care.